We continue our newsmaker show now with uh, the Congressman Tom Reed media call. Reed starts out uh, emphasizing the importance of uh, stimulus phase four and funding local governments. Uh, on the issue of local and state aid and where I think uh, we're going to have to go in order to find that compromise position is twofold. One, uh, we have to make sure that whatever we secure for direct federal aid for local governments is protected uh, from uh, the state governor's offices uh, reaching in and reducing uh, their traditional or established budgetary lines uh, that go to local uh, governments uh, through their traditional support lines where they share uh, revenue and uh, assistance uh, to the local governments in their budgetary process. And we have to m make sure that those efforts at the state level are ma maintained at the previously established um, uh, uh, amounts. Uh, this will prevent what um, I am uh, I call and I experienced when I was mayor of the city of New uh, the city of Corning, uh, where they would essentially engage in bait and switch type tactics at our state capital. Essentially, whatever you secured in direct local aid uh, from the federal government, uh, the uh, state capital will reduce those local assistant lines in the budget, uh, lo and behold, shortly after you secure that amount, and typically uh, those amounts were reduced in the same amount that you secured from the federal government. Uh, that type of uh, um, financial maneuvering uh, cannot be allowed. We just saw it again happen here recently at the state uh, when the state received educational uh, aid. Uh, I think there was $3 billion direct aid and $13 billion uh, in formula uh, uh, aid to um, our school districts. Uh, you saw the governor uh, utilize that money and reduce um, the assistance to our local uh, school districts uh, in, in an amount uh, where the, that aid went to the uh, state capital uh, from our phase three uh, efforts. And so that type of uh, protection, I think, is critical um, for us to uh, make sure occurs as we deal with the issue of local aid. Um, on the issue of state aid, uh, I am sensitive uh, to the argument uh, that we cannot use that state aid uh, resource that will be going to states in order to take care of pre-existing uh, to COVID-19, uh, those budgetary calamities and budgetary shortfalls uh, that the states uh, have incurred uh, at, as a result of no relationship to the COVID-19 situation. And so working with uh, senators and House members, I think there is a formula uh, type of uh, amendment and reform uh, that could be put in place to wall off uh, to make sure uh, that the state aid uh, that is delivered to the states as a result of COVID-19 um, emergencies uh, is directly related uh, to the COVID-19 situation and that uh, any of that assistance money cannot be utilized uh, to fill in pre-COVID-19 uh, scenarios. And so uh, those are the two amendments uh, that I am very um, confident uh, that if we accomplished, uh, there would be bipartisan support uh, for that type of um, uh, state and local aid being secured in our phase four negotiations. I was very pleased to see Senator McConnell uh, talk yesterday about backing off uh, his uh, state bankruptcy uh, commentary and, and recognizing that state and local aid uh, will be in place. I was very pleased about a week ago to uh, shared my um, support and uh, request uh, that the president consider uh, state and local aid. And glad to see his public tweet uh, about a week ago, uh, talking about his support for state and local aid. Um, and so I think uh, we are in, going in the right direction. we got a lot more work to do, um, but we will see uh, how this unfolds, obviously, as we go into phase four. And just know I'm committed to our local governments. I am committed uh, to recognizing that this crisis has impacted them significantly and uh, that we will uh, work with them uh, to make sure that that direct federal aid is delivered uh, to them directly uh, without it getting tied up into state uh, capital uh, type of shenanigans or politics uh, that we often see uh, when this type of debate occurs. And that being said, open to state aid and we'll be in, uh, open to trying to find a solution uh, to the issue that is uh, holding up uh, that issue in regards to uh, the items we discussed. So. All right. That gonna... being said, let's open it up to uh, where we're at. We're going to start with Jerry Zremski. Hey, Tom, how are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good, good. Tell me uh, what the timeline looks like to you right now for this uh, Phase 4 legislation. You know, as I'm looking at it, I think uh, we're looking at May 15th to the uh, 
um, beginning of June is kind of that's my instincts just reading the tea leaves um, but it could go into uh, middle of June uh, possibly uh, that being said I, I'm glad to see that the um, uh, Senate is coming back into session on May 4th now in the house we were supposed to go back on May 4th but that has now been canceled uh, is what the report was uh, was given to me from our our office uh, about two hours ago so we have to get back to legislating uh, in Congress, and so we'll see when we return uh, to Washington, but uh, that will dictate a lot as to uh, the parameters of this final uh, phase four negotiation. But looking at uh, mid-May um, to really be the, the sweet spot of trying to get this phase four package done. Okay, one quick follow-up. Uh, is there anyone that you see in Congress who's really just saying, hey, let's just give it all to the states? Um, or is this going to, if there is state and local aid, is this going to be a pretty easy win to get money directly for the local governments? This, are there people out there in the Congress that really just want the money to go to state capitals? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Um, and it, it, securing direct local aid is not as easy as it sounds. Um, and especially if you do it with that maintenance of efforts protection uh, on receipt of the state aid that I envision uh, will go along with it. Um, because a lot of the governors and a lot of the capitals will not want to be under that restriction. Um, and so uh, this is where the battle uh, will come. And, um, and, and we have to fight. We have to fight for it. Because as they play the shenanigans, if, if we get relief to the local government, and then all of a sudden the budgetary lines that have been established in the state budget and, you know, in New York, we have 90-day authority for the governor to go in and change the budgetary lines mid, uh, midstream. Um, these local governments could be hung out to dry, and we're just not going to let that happen uh, because uh, the times are so sensitive and the crisis that these local governments are facing. They cannot absorb uh, that type of midstream uh, reduction in assistance from the federal government. Okay, thanks. It's the Newsmaker Show. We hope to have the uh, doctors from St. James and St. James CEO Brian O'Donovan coming up in uh, just a few minutes. First, though, uh, uh, we finish up with uh, Congressman Tom Reed. Next question came from WXXI. They wanted to know, compared to Phases 1, 2, and 3 of the stimulus funding, how is Phase 4 going to work in terms of reaching the goals of helping New Yorkers? I think if you're saying... Um you know, to, to try to estimate the magnitude of a phase four package, I will I will tell you, especially if we do an infrastructure bill like I would like to do in phase four, you know, that alone, uh, the goal the president has said is $2 trillion. Um, you look at the economic devastation, uh, and I'm looking at the COVID-19 as a, uh, uh, like a natural disaster that it is, like, a, you know, that it has impacted every nook and cranny uh, of America and America's economy of $22 trillion. Uh, so there's tremendous demand. Uh, for recovery dollars uh, that to be put into that pot that need to be identified. I mean, you look at um, industries like our agricultural community uh, industries. You look at um, you know the state local aid issue. You look at what's happened in regards to uh, you got a deferment and a forbearance on rent and mortgage um, payment uh, that folks are gonna that we're gonna have to deal with because they're, you know we got cash flow issues for individuals. And if you have two months worth of rent that's been for been delayed, uh, how are folks going to cover that? And I think there's also an appetite uh, for a bill that I'm uh, proposing uh, that to uh, reward America's work ethic and our frontline heroes, um, where those folks, you know, we, we gave out $1,200 stimulus checks uh, in this go around to essentially everyone who had a social security number in America. I think it's time that we consider uh, those that stayed in a work position uh, this entire time of the crisis and received a paycheck. And you can monitor your uh, payroll deposits to confirm this. Uh, what you you could do is give them a a uh, uh, bonus uh, for working uh, during this period of time. And so you couple all that together, uh, you are easily going to surpass the magnitude of everything that we have put into this crisis uh, so far. WXXI had a follow up question: What happens if an American citizen files jointly with someone who's not yet an American citizen? And how does that happen? Because I'm not aware that. That U.S. citizen who's filed a tax return or who has a Social Security number, because ultimately the Social Security number is the determining factor, um, that, that U.S. citizen, I assume, has a Social Security number, correct? Yes. So if the taxes are filed jointly and the other person has, so this is a bit more like esoteric, I suppose, but if um, the taxes are filed jointly 
um, and the other person involved in it within the marriage um, has an ITIN, right? They are a taxpayer, but they are not a U.S. citizen. Uh, okay. That apparently disqualifies the U.S. citizen from receiving the stimulus check. This is in I'd like LA to talk time. to that individual. So can you send that individual over to us so that we can communicate with them? Because that U.S. citizen who is married to that uh, non-U.S. citizen spouse uh, should be receiving that $1,200 stimulus check. Okay. Next up was a question from radio reporter Terry Frank of Jamestown. Hey, Terry. Yes. Uh, hi, Tom. How you doing? Good. How you doing, Terry? Pretty well. I think I had mentioned to you uh, about Eddie Sunquist mentioning the uh, mayor of Jamestown about the shortfall that they're projecting. Uh, mm -hmm. In regards to getting aid directly to localities, how would that look aside from the locality, you know, basically applying for it and then getting a check back from the federal government? That's uh, essentially, uh, we've been discussing this in, in the office. So how we envision and how this has happened before uh, is um, obviously there would be funds secured uh, in phase four for direct local aid. Um, there would be a formula upon which that local aid would uh, be determined uh, for the local community to make the application to, to show that they have had this happen in regards to their uh, cost uh, associated with COVID-19. Uh, this happened in regards to the lost revenue and uh, that whole formula can be set forward so that the uh, local government directly receives that um, to the um, uh, to the local government to the local government with no reductions at the state level. So, in other words, uh, once this is approved, you would have to uh, show COVID losses or or whatever from state. Correct. You, the, the, the direct local aid would be for the for those um, losses attributable to the COVID nineteen situation. Um, and obviously, this is subject to final negotiations and the details that uh, would be hash, hash, have to be hashed out is how much would you um, have to show was directly related to um, costs associated with the COVID-19 preparation? Uh, how much would you show as a result of loss of revenue because your uh, your local economy is you've lost sales tax, uh, room tax, the other general revenues because of the, the stay in place orders, things of that nature. And so a loss of uh, revenue calculation I envision will be part of this uh, negotiation and final formula. Very good. Thank you. It's the Newsmaker Show. I'm Brian O'Neill, and um, I just got a phone call and now being joined by St. James CEO Brian O'Donovan. Brian, uh, St. James has of this week started doing the elective or unnecessary surgeries, as some say, and uh, ambulatory treatments. Wondering, how is that going? Were elective, meaning that, um, you know, they weren't urgent or, or emergent. Well, some of these cases have turned into urgent or emergent over the last six or seven weeks. And, um, you know, Dr. Mayer w would have joined us. He's in the OR doing, um, doing these cases and procedures today. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's, you, you think of endoscopy, GI endoscopy screening and those types of things and breast imaging. You don't want to put those, um, those screenings off for very long because if, in the unfortunate event, something is found, the intervention can happen that much quicker. And so I think this is a big advantage um, overall for, for the hospitals in, in upstate New York. And I do think, you know, moving forward, it's, it's going to be a little bit different. I mean, we're not putting um, patients' families together in, in the waiting room for our, for our operating room or our surgery center. We are implementing all of the appropriate safety measures, and, and some of that, Brian, is spacing out cases much further than we normally would do to make sure that we are adhering to social distancing guidelines as well as masking and, um, and the other precautionary measures um, that we need to take to keep our patients and our staff safe. Last week, hospital doctors uh, put out statements saying uh, not to avoid going into the hospital, especially if you needed an ER visit. Uh, the doctors, uh, Dr. Ashdown, Dr. Robshaw, and others, uh, what they said was people seem to be fearful of coming into uh, the emergency room or other places out of a fear of uh, catching COVID-19. So they put out a statement explaining that the, the COVID patients were in a different section and you, you were not going to catch COVID-19 if you walked into St. James. Wondering, has the situation lessened after that statement was put out? You know, it has. And, and I think, uh, Brian, you know, coming from physicians is, is a very different message than, than coming from me. I mean, these physicians 
Um, you know, they've, they've been around quite a long time, and, and um, you know, they're the ones that are taking direct care of our patients. Um, you know, I, I think the one thing that, that's really crucial uh, to know is, you know, we've had 20 to 30 um, inpatient COVID positives, and we've done such a good job with PPE and not exposing our staff or other patients. And now what we're seeing is a decrease. Um, this is the first time in five days in a row, at least the testing that we have done, and we're usually doing about 15 to 20 COVID tests a day throughout our organization on patients, we had zeros five days in a row, zero positives out of, let's say, 50, 50 to 60 tests. So I'm extremely encouraged um, um, by this. We have not seen that, a stretch of zero positives um, at St. James in, in at least, you know, six to seven weeks. So I, there is definitely light at the end of the tunnel here, and I give a lot of credit to the community for really taking the, the social distancing measures um, seriously, as well as our, our team here um, using protective uh, personal protective equipment and um, for the other precautionary measures that we've implemented. Does it ever occur to you, uh, Brian O'Donovan, the CEO of St. James, you know, who you are now, a CEO of a small town hospital, does it ever hit you? Uh, when you're in your workplace, how many great doctors they are, both the hometown doctors and those who have come to live here from other states and countries? Every day. So I can tell you I've come from big systems, Brian. I worked for the U of R for 10 years and still, you know, obviously with, as an affiliate, um, I've worked in heart transplant. I've been the administrator there. I've opened other medical ambulatory centers. And, um, you know, these doctors are on par with, with, with the doctors that I've worked with at other places. And, you know, I look at the John Robshaws, I look at the Izzy Mayors, and I, I, I just look around at, you know, our, our, our current medical staff as well as the additional medical staff, the 15 um, new medical staff that we've added. And, and we, we really have such a, a great diversity and plethora of our medical staff. So, it does, and, and I can tell you, watching, um, you know, Izzy Intubate Patients, um, John Robshaw, and many others, it, it, it's definitely humbling, and, and I'm, uh, you know, very grateful to be a part of this team. Donations coming into St. James during this COVID situation. How's that been going? It, it's been awesome. I mean, really, you, you, you know, our team, we're, we're so focused. Let's take the first three or four weeks and physically exhausted. Our, my team was physically exhausted and emotionally exhausted. And then you get, um, you know, these free lunches. Or we had uh, this, this awesome family that decided, I think the boys were like four and six, and pardon me if I get their ages wrong, they go out and they paint rocks. And they, and they bring these rocks in with, with these cool messages on them. And, you know, and it doesn't stop there. I mean, I think we have, we've been tallying the, the, the spreadsheet of all the donations. You know, we're at like 80 different either organizations or people that have thought about us and uh, taken the time to, to donate. And it, it means a ton, um, you know, to, to our team here when they're so focused on patient care. But, you know, it is, uh, I think it's a great piece of humanity. I think this, this community is, is really uh, quite fantastic. I mean, really stellar. St. James CEO Brian O'Donovan, I want to thank you uh, so much for uh, joining us today on Newsmaker. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Have a, have a great weekend. Thank you very much. It's AM 1480 WLEA Hornell. Send the link, Katrina.